morning everyone and welcome to the video. Michael Petro here, rocking it barefoot strong as always and here today to share with you episode two of our series on stability and efficiency. Let's roll. So today we're gonna to be discussing three specific things. First, we're gonna talk about what happens to the body when there's a lack of sensory awareness. Second, we're gonna talk about what happens to the body when there is suboptimal structural preferences. talk specifically about how a lack of sensory awareness and suboptimal structural preferences will greatly influence movement efficiency from the ground up. So we may have all have heard of or played the game of telephone. And this game is really about interpreting a message or a word. Now typically it takes place where someone is going to say a specific word or message and they're going to whisper it to someone else and then it's going to go down line to through the group and then eventually someone at the end is going to have to interpret that or going to be able to say what they heard with that message being passed down. Now if you've played that game you know that the message and the phrase typically is not exactly what was mentioned in the very beginning and that's quite significant because as messages transfer from one person to another there could be a loss in the context and the communication or the the interpretation and context of it now in our modern day we have a wide range of communication which could be more general it could be more specific in fact that's why i'm here at starbucks because a lot of communication takes place here now general we might think of texting emails perhaps maybe even more phone calls as we get into more specific. And then specific might be, say, a Skype or Zoom call where you can see the person and have a conversation or an in-person conversation. Now, what's significant about this continuum, so to speak, is that as we go from general to specific, we get more clarity on that given message. Now, if we go from specific to general and we have a less lesser context to be able to interpret, i.e. we don't have the nonverbals, we don't have all the, the body language we're getting from that individual that we're talking with, that will affect the context and the message that comes across. Now, this is very similar to how the body is as well. The body has to sense the environment to get a, an idea of what is really happening. And if it's unable to do that, or it doesn't map that or make an understanding of where the message is coming from in the right way, then that is going to have a tremendous effect on how the interpretation of the message is. So to best understand this brain-body mapping process, we need to look into the brain at the somatosensory cortex, namely the sensory strip, which divides the, the frontal and parietal lobes in the brain and has a lot to do with how the body senses various information, of course, how it also responds to it, but how, how it also prioritizes that information that comes in. Now, if you've ever seen pictures online where you have that figure that has big, big hands, big feet, big lips, and big genitals, that would be called the homunculus. Now, why those areas are bigger than some of the other areas is because that's the priority. Those are the areas that are more sensory rich. And if you think about it, practically speaking, if my hands are key with trying to figure out where I'm at in space, my lips due to eating and food and the face is very sensitive as well. I need to protect my face. I also need to eat, that's part of survival. And if you think about it too, with the feet, I need to know where I'm at in space. And of course the genitals are usually a sensitive area. So if we get hit there, it doesn't usually feel too good, right? Um, but it also has to do with procreation and, and uh, survival and so on. So you can see how all of these areas 
are very much related to how the brain prioritizes information. Now, when it comes to lack, sensory-wise, if the brain is not able to sense an area more effectively because it's never been exposed to it or has, has very minimal exposure to that, that's going to affect the perception, which is going to be altered, and how the body responds with specificity to that given stress, stressor and stimulus. And that's important for us to understand because when it comes to being an efficient mover or movement efficiency, our goal is to have the most accuracy in our interpretation of the information as well as the right response to meet those specific demands. Like with most organs, parts, and organ systems in the body, they are completely integrated. Meaning, if you make a change to one, it'll affect all, and sometimes in a very dramatic way. Now, this is especially the case with the brain, because the brain is a localized structure that it consists of a bunch of different parts all working together and sharing information. It's very complicated. Now, within the complexity of the brain, we could make sense of this by breaking it down into three divisions. So first of these divisions would be the neocortex. And we think of the neocortex, we think of new cortex. We think of a newer version or a newer part of the brain. It's often called the new mammalian brain, which is about thought, reasoning, being able to plan out movements and coordinated strategies and so on. And it's also known for housing the somatosensory cortex that has a lot to do with how the brain takes in information and actually responds to it. The second of these divisions would be the limbic system. Now this system is comprised of parts related specifically to feeling and motivation. When we think of feeling and motivation, we can't help but think about its relation to emotion, its connection to memory, and so on. So the limbic system has a lot to do with emotion, memory, motivation, and moving forward and having the will to move forward in a given direction. And the third division is the brainstem. And this system is comprised of parts all related to internal regulation of body processes that are wired into safety and survival. So a few things we think about here would be, one, we think of temperature, hot or cold. We think of breathing, and breathing patterns. We think also of eating and sleeping and sexual functions, reproductive functions. All of those are hardwired into this idea of survival. Now, when it comes down to what we typically think of the brainstem, in this context with filtering, we have to look at the autonomic nervous system, which is housed within this system, which plays a huge role in how the body interprets information and responds accordingly to it. Each of these systems works off and from the information from the others, moving it back and forth as it senses, interprets, and coordinates proper responses to specific stimulus, task, and or perceived threat. Important to this dynamic internal communication process is the speed and accuracy by which the information is perceived and then received. One specific system or key system that influences this is the reticular activating system, also known as the RAS. The reticular activating system is a subsystem of the reticular formation. It's typically known as a modulatory system that works closely with the thalamus to trigger alertness and focus in the brain. It also strongly influences our conscious awareness on incoming sensory information. Dr. Emily Splickle calls this system the ignition to the brain and a system that needs to be properly activated in order for optimal learning to take place. It actually helps filter out the information that we're getting bombarded with on a daily basis so we're not just running around with every stimulus affecting us. But we can actually prioritize right and move in the right direction. So this is typically how this system works and it has is hardwired into the sensory system connected into spatial awareness and spatial orientation with the visual and, and vestibular systems and has a wide range of connecting connections connecting from the brainstem all the way out to the cortex and this plays a key role in providing alertness or consciousness to the brain and body while also helping heighten focus the integration of this system with the collective brain team so to speak plays a key role in influencing how the body interprets information and formulates responses so it can move more efficiently from the ground up. Where the brain goes, blood and energy flows. In other words, if the brain can sense it, it can actually respond with the right amount of resources towards it. Think of blood flow, think about a neurological connection. If it can't, i.e. there's a sensory lack there, 
then the brain is not going to be able to allocate the right resources to that local area. So the body is going to have to respond either way. And typically the body responds with stiffness and tension to pump blood and to also create stability within. It's going to do that in excess a lot of times when it can't find that local area, which means the body is going to tense up through the whole system in a much more excessive way. And because of that, that will affect movement efficiency from the ground up. So let's put some flesh on this idea. You're a personal trainer in the gym environment and Andrew walks in and he has a wide range of goals. You sit down, chat with him a little bit, try to get a better idea of what his goals are so you can be more strategic in how you help him get there. Now, in this process, you discover a few things. So as you dig a little deeper, you find out that Andrew has been very active over his life, meaning he's done a lot of performance-related activities, and because of that, he's, he's accumulated a wide range of activities, which will affect his body and how it presents today. As you pull in this thread a little bit more, you find out that he had a bad experience in a gym environment that potentially contributed to some of his low back pain that he has, and that was also linked into a lot of, you'd say, not very good experience he had there with his trainer, but also with the salesy process that was there in place, where they were trying to really push various programs on his wife and or him. Now he's coming back into this environment, and you'd say he has some baggage. A lot of his conscious and subconscious processing of that gym environment, the various trainers, the, um, the sales folk that are there, create a, a picture in this in Andrew's head of how safe was this place. So whether he sees it or not, subconsciously he's bringing this to the table when he comes into the gym. Now, we can link this back to what we talked about with the reticular activation system and this idea of perception, which ties strongly into the limbic system and this emotional charge that would have come from this past injury. Now, because of this, He's going to come in here probably a little bit more tense and guarded than he would, than he would normally. And this is significant because when we start to look at tension in the body, which is often seen as a bad thing, in Andrew's case, it's just a normal process for him. His body is tense because of some of his injuries. Probably a lot of tension around his hips and his low back, possibly up in his torso and neck, pretty much his whole his body probably because of the past injuries he sustained. And now you start to put in the more psychological element that comes in where he had this bad perceptive experience from the, the gym environment in this specific gym. Now he's bringing this tension with him. We want to unpack this from a, a few different perspectives. We want to look at this from a sensitive perspective. What are some things that he might need in his body? We tied together, we talked a little bit about the homunculus earlier and how important it is for the hands and the feet and of course the, the mouth and so on, to be able to connect to the environment. Now in his case, there's going to be a need to connect to the feet and the hands. Now, this is a big part that we want to address in his future programming because he also expressed in his intake, in his consultation, that he had just started with some minimal shoes. He's used to having basketball shoes that he plays with on the weekends and, and any other activity and running shoes. But he just recently got tipped off and hooked into this idea that more minimal type running and shoe footwear is actually better for him. He decided to go straight in on this whole process and get these minimal shoes. Now, went going from a, a shoe that had higher lift or drop to something that had no drop affected his will affect his mechanics greatly. And he come, he's coming in not only with his back pain, which comes up usually when he's working out after his workouts. It's not chronic. Um, but he's also starting to get a little bit of foot pain, kind of achy type pain. This could be related directly to his transition from his basketball shoes and running shoes to his minimal footwear. So needless to say, we need to bring in the right amount of sensory information to help him onboard this process and to get the right connection from the ground up so he can move better, not only when he's playing basketball, but when he's actually riding quads, as well as when he's actually running and doing all the workouts that he does at the gym. So the second piece we want to address is that pertaining to his structural preferences, some of the patterns and positions he, positions he's locked down and does on a regular basis. We need to treat.
train him in a way that's going to be relevant for not only for his activities he wants to do, but to create better movement economy from the ground up. And we're going to get into this piece a little bit more in the next video. And with tying both of these in, we're going to talk about this more in the third video of this series, which will be episode four, where we get into movement efficiency. And we're going to go into a gym environment and actually unpack some practical solutions from the sensory perspective, sensory awareness, as well as to help him with his structural preferences, structural preferences, and to be able to tie all this together in a way that's going to be relevant, practical, and onboard him right so he can move freely with less pain and achieve optimal performance. So earlier we talked about communication being either general or more specific. And in order for it to be interpreted properly, it needs to have the right context. Now we likened that to the body and saw how the body is very similar in that it is always about bringing in information, sometimes general information, sometimes very specific information. To the body, it's always a specific type of information and it's going to process that in a specific way. We want to make the interpretation of that process the most effective to where we're actually sensing properly and responding with the most accuracy possible. So earlier we asked the question, what happens when there's a lack of sensory awareness? The answer to that question is twofold. First, we see an affected brain-body mapping process. Two, we're gonna see altered perception. Now, what that means is that if the brain and body can't take in and gather the right information in the right way and process it accordingly and perceive it accurately, that's going to affect how the body responds with accuracy and efficiency and precision ultimately affecting movement efficiency. So this section we're wrapping up in the sensory. The next section we're gonna talk more about the structural, the structural preferences and how those influence movement efficiency as well. Let's roll.